Today we have uh, quite a bit to uh, cover. Um, and uh, it's notable both in terms of uh, substance and in terms of breadth. Uh, so I'm planning to, to, to quickly uh, survey uh, three different areas of um, note for HR-based modeling, um, which are often uh, go unmentioned within uh, the context of dynamic modeling classes and in fact, past iterations of this class. Uh, the first concerns a, um, an abstraction uh, as to transition rates that uh, has come up uh, successively in system dynamics modeling, in agent-based modeling in the form of rate transitions. And uh, we will see it again uh, within the, the guise of um, discrete event simulation. And this has to do with uh, continuous time transition processes uh, where there's a certain probability per unit time of leaving uh, a state. Uh, and we emphasize this uh, in the context of uh, constructs such as the force of infection, uh, first order delays for system dynamics, but it, it's an important thing to understand in the context of uh, state charts, uh, which are a key building block of agent-based models conceptually and as reified, as captured explicitly within any logic. So we're gonna be dealing with that. We're gonna be uh, then uh, continuing on to a discussion of models of control. And this reflects a sea change as it were uh, from an older style of agent-based modeling to a newer style. But it also reflects uh, a change in the way programming is done more generally. Um, speaking as a professor of software engineering as well as of modeling, you'll find the same sort of transition uh, playing out within the context of uh, software development. And as computer scientists, it's uh, appropriate that you be aware of that transition there. Um, the third topic that we'll be speaking about uh, is um, in the area of, of the, the notion of time and Specifically, agent-based models have traditionally um, placed a particular emphasis on discrete models of time and indeed of space. Uh, when I'm speaking discrete here, I'm not, I'm not speaking about uh, uh, something that can be uh, trusted with confidential secrets. I'm, I'm speaking about something that um, has a, uh, a countable number of defined um, specific elements within it. It's a, it's a set of uh, particular components rather than a continuum. And uh, within recent uh, years and really in the past decade, um, multiple agent-based modeling packages have sought to make available to agent-based modelers a, uh, an abstraction that's different, um, one that that hews to a continuous model of time and indeed a continuous model of space, although the, the two aren't, don't necessarily go together. Um, in other words, they, they don't have to come to get one with the other. Um, and I wanted to talk about uh, these, uh, these differences because uh, they bear, bear noting in the sense of how we approach an agent-based model um, and uh, our choices for structuring it vis-a-vis uh, -vis capturing the effects of different types of events. So we're gonna be talking about continuous and discrete time as, as time allows. Um, I think I will, um, I plan to cover that third, but I think I'll cover that um, after a discussion of hazard rates as really that's a continuous time abstraction. Um, Okay, so uh, with that being said, we're going to dive into the, to the first component of this. Um, and I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully you'll see the first of the presentations here. I'm gonna break these up into separate recordings um, for your ease of uh, your viewing pleasure um, and ease of finding material. Uh, so my plan, within this segment of today's session is to speak about um, continuous time transitions. Uh, these transitions were so notable as to almost go without mentioning 
in the context of system dynamics modeling. Um, so in this model, for example, of, of infection spread with a vaccinated component, so germane to the current context, um, we had a number of processes that um, were first order delays or variants thereof or classic infection spread nonlinear terms here for incidence. Um, but in all of these cases, um, it was a fruitful uh, way of framing the issue uh, for these outflows from a given stock to, to think of them as uh, from the point of view of a, uh, a member, as it were, of, of that stock, a, a person who's susceptible. Um, and, and to ask, you know, what's their chance per unit time of uh, progressing to be vaccinated, uh, for example, or of dying from, from other causes than the infection, or of becoming infected. And in some cases, we gave um, uh, formal uh, dignity of names to, uh, to some of these uh, probabilities per unit time of becoming X. So for example, in the context of uh, infection, we had the force of infection, which was a chance per unit time that someone who was susceptible would become infected. Um, it was a probability per unit, unit time. Uh, and uh, similarly, uh, within the context of something like um, uh, the recovered person who then becomes susceptible again due to waning immunity, we spoke about a, um, uh, a rate of waning immunity. Uh, frequently, these terms go by the name hazard rates, um, not because they're always associated with uh, a health risk, a hazard, uh, but it's, it's a term of art that's used particularly in the statistics sphere. But uh, what they are at a, at a more uh, technical level is uh, temporal probability densities, okay? Um, they're not a probability. I emphasized that from early on. The value can be greater than, than one. Um, and for example, if we had someone who was susceptible and we had a probability density, a hazard rate, a, a force of infection of greater than one um, per day, uh, what it would mean is they tend to be infected in less than one day on average, because you'll remember that the average time in a stock was one over the value of the, uh, this, this rate. Uh, so if there was a force of infection, they'd remain in the stock for time one over the force of infection, if that were the only outflow. Um, but while these were central to uh, the enterprise of dynamic modeling with stock and flow models, uh, they're not limited to that. And within agent-based modeling, um, I'm going to ask you to review a video uh, for later this week, which is on the state chart constructs, which you see here on the right. And uh, these state charts are uh, of, of central value in characterizing the dynamics of uh, agent-based models. Like stock and flow models, they capture at once three major points of, of um, significance in specifying a model. Number one, the different states which are possible. Number two, the actions that can change those states, in this case indicated with these transitions. And thirdly, the rules under which those actions take place. We saw the same sort of division within, within stock and flow models. We saw arrayed before us here to the left, the different possible states someone could be in, the actions that can lead them to transition between states and uh, Implicit in there, but Bill illustri illustrated at a certain level of abstraction was the rules by which those actions are governed. Um, we can see at least the dependencies by which they're governed by seeing, for example, that incidence depends on a force of infection and the number that are susceptible, or that vaccination depended on the number of susceptible and a monthly likelihood of vaccination. Um, so 
uh, state charts like stock and flow models capture at once the, the set of states, the actions that can change those states and the rules governing those actions. And one of the key types of, of, of rules, one of the key types of rules that governs a, an action associated with a transition is um, denoted by these, uh, this symbol, which has a curve that if you squint looks a bit like a declining exponential. And uh, this curve is supposed to be indicative of the fact that indeed the resonance time in exposed is associated with a exponential decrease over time that is driven by a fixed rate in this transition. You may recall the mathematics of that are such, we saw it in system dynamics model with first order delays, that if you have a, a fixed chance per unit time of leaving a stock, um, the, uh, the probability that you remain in that stock uh, after time t decreases is e to the minus alpha t, where alpha is this, this rate of transition per unit time, this hazard rate, this probability density. Um, and within state charts, we see that same abstraction, except here it's applying to a particular person, uh, the person who is in the, exp uh, a person who is in the exposed state has dynamics uh, characterized by that, um, that memoryless transition process. Uh, it doesn't care how long you've been in the exposed state, you have that same chance per unit time of leaving. Um, uh, and you see it uh, in spades all around uh, this model for waning of immunity, for people recovering, for people proceeding on from an asymptomatic state, a pre-symptomatic state to a symptomatic state and exposing others with this internal transition. So all of those are governed by the mathematics associated with hazard rates. And I'd like to dive into that mathematics rate a little bit more. Okay, so uh, I wanna build understanding of this and uh, it will hopefully uh, further cement your appreciation for some of the mathematics associated with first order delays and, and system dynamics. So, so let's imagine that we have a hazard rate, a probability per unit time of, of alpha, okay? And I'm gonna walk you through a set of exercises to help you think through the, the mathematics that emerges to help you appreciate where the, whence that mathematics comes. So imagine that we have some unit, some interval of time from time zero to time T, okay? Um, and uh, imagine we have only one chance of, we only flip the coin once uh, as to, to uh, whether we uh, have transitioned over that time or not. So we have uh, a chance per unit time of, of transitioning of, of alpha, um, it's per unit time. And so if we need a probability, we have a probability per unit time uh, over time of transitioning over time t, then we're gonna have to multiply that by by t to get a probability, because alpha is a probability per unit time. So if we multiply alpha times t, we'll get the probability that, that we transitioned within that, that period of time. And the probability of not transitioning in that time is just one minus that. Either you transition or you don't over time t. You have only one kick at the can, one shot at it. So um, we have this probability of of alpha t, okay? Um, now, now let's imagine that this time interval uh, is still of length t, but it's broken up into two segments, um, which are mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. So there, there's the first segment and there's the second segment, okay? Um, uh, so we have two chances, a, a chance of of leaving in the first section, chance of leaving in the second section. We have two kicks at the can. But there's a twist here, right? Um, your chance of leaving in the first half, time t over two, is not alpha t, like it was when we had the whole time to consider. Uh, whoa, it's alpha t times t over two, because we're considering your ch ch chance of leaving in, in this uh, period of time. And we have this probability per unit time of alpha so we multiply it by how much time we have, t over two, and we get 
we have chance of alpha times t over two of leaving in the first half, right? And the probability of not leaving in the first half is just one, uh, one minus that, right? Uh, we're confining our attention just to this first half right now. So either we do leave alpha times t over two or we don't. And we have, and, th and that will have a probability of one minus alpha over two too. But now let's reason about the whole interval. That was just for the first half. Now let's 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 think about the the whole interval, right? This gets, um, if not gnarly, it gets a little bit um, articulated, right? Um, look, the only way. So let's consider whether or not we transition over this entire interval too. See, you know, um, what are the possible ways that that it could come about that we do not transition over the entire interval. We don't transition over time t. Well, the only possible way that could come about is if we didn't transition in interval, the first interval, and we didn't transition in the second, right? I mean, if we transition either of them, um, we, we, we're gonna have transitioned sometime in, in that interval of length t. So the only way we could not have transition and, and time t is by avoiding it, dodging the bullet in the first half, dodging the bullet in the second half, right? You gotta dodge both those bullets to not to dodge the bullet for the entire time t. Okay, um, we said before, the probability of not transitioning the first interval is, is, is one minus t over two. Um, now, what's the chance that we, we also don't don't uh, uh, transition in the second interval. Well, look, um, if we didn't transition in the first interval, probability one minus t over over two, we've also got to not transition the second interval. Uh, and uh, and so in this case, we have to have the first and the second. So we're going to multiply these two probabilities to find the probability that we didn't transition the first and we didn't transition in the second, okay? Um, and, and so the probability of remaining in the state not transitioning is gonna be one minus alpha t divided by two quantity squared, okay? We need to, we need to have not done it in the first half and then given that we haven't yet, not do it in the second half. So we multiplied them. So the probability of of actually that we did transition over the entire interval is one minus that. This is the probability we didn't transition at any point in time t. This is the probability that we will have transitioned in, in uh, time t, okay? Um, so let's uh, generalize that now to three intervals, okay? I think you may see where this is going. If we had three intervals, the only way we're not going to have transitioned over the entire interval t is if we dodge three bullets, right? We have to dodge the first bullet, the second bullet, the third bullet. Each of them is associated with a probability of one minus alpha t over three. Um, and the only way you're eligible to not transition the second interval is if, if you didn't the first time. So the probabilities multiply. You have to do the first one, you have to get through the second one and the third one. So the probability of remaining in the state is one minus alpha t over three, you know, cubed, right? Um, and the probability of, of transitioning over that state somewhere over the state is one minus that. Um, this, this incorporates the fact you might've gone in the first, might've gone in the second, might've gone in the third. And in general, if we have N intervals, uh, we have intervals one to N, uh, we're going to have the probability that we remain in the state is going to be of this form. Oh, okay. So um, um, mumble, mumble, mumble. Um, this does not look uh, good. So we're going to fix this up uh, on the fly. Um, it's ugly, but it, um, it's, it's better than um, the ugliness associated with uh, an error. Okay, so, so here we have these n intervals uh, going from zero to, to time t. Um, the, 
for each one of them, we have a probability of not transitioning of one minus alpha t over n, right? Um, and, and here, the only way that we remain in the state through all of them is if, if we've dodged all n bullets. We have to dodge the first, we have to dodge the second, given that we dodged the first, the third, given that we dodged the second and the first, et cetera. And so the probabilities in, in this case uh, of, of not transitioning multiply, right? Um, it's kind of like uh, if you have a 10% chance of being uh, hit by the bullet in the first, uh, the first time, you have only a 90% chance of avoiding it. And you've got to avoid it the first time, and then you've got to avoid it the second time. So you get point, you know, one minus point one is do dodging the first time times one minus point one, the second time times one minus point one, the third time. You got to dodge it every every time. So the probability of not of, of transitioning somewhere in the interval is just one minus this. Uh, uh, if, if you transition any one of those, you you won't uh, you you will have uh, transitioned. So the probability of transitioning of the entire interval is, is one minus this. Now here's the thing: if we have n steps, uh, the error is, has crept in. It's um, it's pernicious. Okay. Um, uh, so here, if we think about n as n grows, and as we say, n grows towards infinity, it becomes really really large. It turns out that this ends up, this, this quantity here, ends up approaching exactly the definition of the exponential with, uh, with the, uh, the exponent being minus alpha t, okay? Uh, and you can actually see this if you think about its Taylor series expansion. I know Jeff has posted some wonderful support resources to understand that. But if you were to go, you know, uh, uh, do this for two n equals two, and do it for n equals three, and do it for n equals four, and sort of imagine how it it gets larger as as n grows larger and larger. You'll find it it ends up approaching the the Taylor series expansion of e to the minus alpha t, um, which is one minus alpha t plus alpha t squared quantity over two factorial. Uh, minus alpha t cubed uh, over three factorial, et cetera. And, and that's exactly what this approach is. And so we get a, uh, a pattern out here that our chance of, of staying within, uh, uh, within the state without transitioning in any of these time steps, it goes down as e to the minus uh, alpha t. Um, and the probability of transitioning sometime in there is one minus it, okay? Um, it's notable that the smaller the n, or you know, the, the smaller the value is, the number of n, if we go from one interval, uh, one interval to two, to three uh, successively, uh, it's notable that we, we have to dodge it during each of these uh, time periods, but for each time period, we have less and less of a probability that we will in fact be hit by the bullet, right? Because it's a smaller and smaller interval of time. Um, uh, there's less and less chance we will have transitioned during that particular interval, but we have more intervals to consider. And the exponential reflects the fact that we have a continuous time. We could leave at any time. At any point all along there, we could leave. And uh, for any one small, small, small interval, the chance of leaving is very small, but we have a huge number of those intervals and we could leave at any point. And this is the requisite mathematics that comes out of it. Uh, this is the mathematics, e to the minus alpha t. Uh, the longer t is, it, it decreases exponentially your probability of remaining in that state, which is exactly what we saw for first order delays. Hopefully that woke some of you up. Um, okay, so uh, you know, let's let's think about this comparison between a hazard rate, as we've seen here. This is what alpha is, which expresses this continuous chance born all through the interval of leaving. At any one small interval, you always have this chance of leaving. 
versus a transition probability, just an overall blanket probability. Did you leave in that interval or not? Um, and look, for, for a probability, if, if we're given a probability, like the probability someone dies in the next year, that's not a hazard rate, actually. Um, it's, it's a probability that they, you know, that they would die over an entire year. It may be close to a hazard rate if it's for a smaller period of time, but um, uh, with a probability, you're talking about one trial. Did they or did they not during that entire year? Somewhere in that entire year. For a hazard rate, you're talking about continuous trials. Each of these little time intervals, you have some slight kick of the can for transitioning. It's small, but you've got a huge number of these intervals and you can go at any, any, any point there. Um, uh, I prefer talking about kicks of the can rather than talking about dodging bullets. Um, uh, maybe these days we should talk about dodging infection, right? Uh, uh, okay, so uh, suppose we have a probability P of having transitioned by time T. This is very common. Those working on projects may find data like this, you know, the, uh, the probability that someone died in, in a year or the probability that, uh, uh, that there was a, uh, you know, a uh, release of some, uh, uh, of some substance within a, a period of time or the probability that a visitor would arrive on a per day basis. This is a probability of having transitioned over some period of time, okay? Um, and it's it's not a continuous construct. It's you know, did you leave uh, in in at least you know in time less than or equal to that? And uh, we know from from this last slide that the probability of having transitioned is one minus this probability of not having transitioned, which goes down exponentially. So if we have a probability over some period of time t of something happening we can turn it into a hazard rate by recognizing that these two are equal. We, all we have to do is say, look, that probably was observed over a time period of, of, of some amount. Maybe it's a month, maybe it's a year, maybe it's a day. Um, whatever it is, uh, that's a value of T. And if we wanna turn that into a continuous time kick at the can, we, we just set these two equal. This one minus X is just from this, this probability of of having transitioned sometime in there. And you know, solving is a simple matter of algebra and taking the log on both sides. And what you get out is alpha just equals minus the natural log of one minus P, okay? Um, so if you have a probability P, you can turn it into a continuous time. You have a probability P for some interval of time T, you can turn it into a continuous time uh, hazard rate through um, through using this formula. And uh, I'm going to just emphasize that that is alpha, right? Um, that is alpha there. Okay, so uh, we can go from just talking about the probability of having transition in time T to instead talk about what would the hazard rate be if it's exercised all along the way. And it turns out that these two alpha and P will be very close to each other if alpha t is quite small. It's very small. If it's close to, you know, quite close to zero, um, these two are going to be very close because the Taylor expansion of this is uh, is going to have uh, later terms that are negligible. So it's it's going to be uh, very uh, very close by. Okay, so so let's talk about some summaries here. I know I've rushed you through a lot. I put this at the beginning of the lecture compared to some more gentle material for this reason, but let's talk about this. A hazard rate, the things we saw here with the force of infection, the things we saw with first order delays, with uh, transitions for mortality, for vaccination, the things that you'll be seeing all the time for the state charts, those are continuous constructs. They represent a probability, they're associated with a probability per unit time of transitioning where you could transition at any time period where N is goes to infinity. You could leave at any time point. That's what a hazard rate reflects. It reflects this continuous chance of, of leaving any time in that interval. 
um, it applies all through the interval. And it's different than, it's different than the probability of having transitioned by the end of that interval. Um, this is something which, which kind of summarizes what happened across all that period of time, whereas the hazard rate is, is saying, what's your chance in each little period of time, right? Your pr chance per unit time. Um, so for a hazard rate, the probability of remaining at least time t goes, declines exponentially is the exponent of minus alpha t. We, we saw that for first order delays uh, many weeks ago now. And we also saw at that time that the mean time before transitioning is one over alpha. It's one over that, it's a reciprocal of that. And I argued through dimensional considerations that it made sense. And I showed how you could define a first order transition and where the outflow here is, you know, one over a mean time infected or so infective divided by mean time infective or infectives times some probability per unit time of leaving, some alpha, right? Um, one is just one over the other. Um, it has to be that way. Uh, now, it is worth noting that, look, um, and this is different from a probability. Look, if you have a probability of leaving in time uh, per per day of, let's say, 0.5, no, a coin flip chance of leaving your home per day. Your chance of leaving your probability, so that's a probability of, of 0.5 for every day. I wish I had a coin here. Um, but if you ask then, that's per day, how if you ask, what's your chance of leaving per week? You cannot simply, uh, multiply that by seven, even though a, a week is seven times as long, um, your probability of leaving per week is most certainly not seven times 0.5. That wouldn't make sense. That's not a probability. It's greater than one, right? It's 3.5. It doesn't compute. You can't take a probability and just multiply it uh, to scale up the interval to go from probability per day to probability per week. It doesn't work that way. With a hazard rate, you can. You can, ladies and gentlemen. And it's a thing of beauty. And in my mind, a joy forever. Um, so if you have a chance per unit time uh, of leaving of alpha uh, for, let's say, a daily uh, hazard rate, your weekly hazard rate was, is just seven times that. It just scales up linearly. Um, and uh, you know, there's defined reasons for it, but the fundamental reason is the dimensional structure. So that probability per unit time. And uh, so it's very definition um, is defined around a unit of time. And we can always choose our units differently. We can choose to measure things in days or weeks. The world doesn't care. Um, uh, the value is just gonna be, be different if, we're, if we measure it in weeks. Um, if we have a hazard rate per day of leaving our home and we want to turn into a hazard rate per week of leaving our home, we just multiply by seven. Um, the dimensional structure captures that. And that's a nice thing about hazard rates. Um, it's a thing that prevents headaches. Uh, so remember that to avoid headaches on your final exam. Um, so if we have a probability of, of having transitioned over some period of time uh, t, uh, we can turn it into a hazard rate and get this tremendous flexibility. Uh, for the common case, it's, it's just going to where, where we have a unit interval of time, which is very common for what you read in terms of uh, data, for example. This hazard is, well, it's just divided by one. Um, so t is one. And so we just get minus the natural log of, of one minus p. Okay, so bear this in mind about hazard rates. You might have thought that a hazard rate is kind of an impoverished probability, but it's not like that at all. It's, it's a continuous time expression of your chance per leaving. And uh, it reflects the fact that you could leave at any point during the period of time. 
it can be close to the prob associated probability for unit time, but only if alpha t, the, the time period over which we're, we're considering it, is very, very small. Um, but it has this very nice property of scaling, uh, which is uh, which which affords us uh, uh, a very nice way of formulating our models. So when it comes to rate transitions, well, of a certain chance per unit time, say chance per day, of leaving a state uh, for an Asian-based model, you'll know what this reflects. It's the same mathematics that was reflected in system dynamics, and some of the same mathematics that. Uh, very similar to the mathematics we'll see in some areas of discrete event simulation. Okay, um, hazard rates, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and the ways of converting from probabilities to them. First time I've given this lecture, but I hope it's helpful in getting your hands around a slip, getting your your arms around a slippery concept. Um, I'm going to stop my sharing for a moment and stop recording. Um, so that I can transition to the next set of materials here.